Hey folks, Matthew Hill here, Helen Ponton for another VA Q&A session. Unfortunately, it's just me. My counterpart, Carol, could not make it today. So hopefully I can answer the questions in a way that uh, not only you deserve, but uh, entertain you as well. So let's jump right in here with our first question it is from David Martin. Is it, is it true regarding SMCS, special monthly compensation slash S, that if you have multiple conditions of the same uh, ideology, uh, ideology, um, same origin, um, that add up to 100% and then another to 60 that it would qualify for SMCS. You don't necessarily need one condition at 100. This is a super tricky involved question, David. Uh, the case law is at best unclear. Um, what I would say uh, the VA follows and, and I think kind of the current state of the law is that you have to have one disability that adds to 100%. Um, could you have diabetes and neurological problems caused by the diabetes? So diabetes with neuropathy, I think you could do that. But if you had diabetes and a secondary heart condition, secondary kidney condition, um, that would not count. OK, uh, usually what I see is one condition is 100 percent or one condition is, um, you know, at, at an, like 60 percent for a back that you can then parlay that into unemployability. And then you have those other conditions that, that combine to 60 uh, percent. Uh, so you definitely cannot do something where you have one condition and the secondary conditions. But if you have one condition, um, that is, and the secondary conditions are so tied into that. So uh, radiculopathy with a back, or you could do, um, you know, neuro neuropathy with an actual uh, diagnosis of diabetes. I think those could could come in, uh, but not, um, unfortunately, not the uh, secondary conditions like the heart or the back. You could have depression or you could have bladder issues. So kind of complicated, but you want to try to keep it to one, one um, disability as much as you can. All right, Steve, Golf War Vet, got myself to 86 so far and mom to DIC plus ANA with no Nexus letters, H and P and CC rock. Thank you so much. That's great to hear, Steve. I'm glad you're able to help your mom to get not only DIC, but the A and A in attendance. That's super valuable because that really bumps up what she's able to get there. So great going. Glad we could uh, help just a little bit. Um, and Combat Craig is, is a huge help with all his different, uh, what, what he does as well. So good to see that. Yolanda, good to see you again. Does, DA, does VA duty to assist, DTA, include looking for or looking at and awarding secondary conditions if they see those conditions in your medical records as they review the current primary claim? Or do you have to file those for them? Beautiful question. Your claim is everything you put to paper and then everything that the evidence shows, okay? So again, we were just talking about diabetes. Um, common, most, most common secondary condition there is neuropathy. So if you go in for your diabetes and they see that, hey, yes, you have a diagnosis of diabetes, but you can't feel your fingers or your toes tingle and they diagnose you with neuropathy, the only thing that causes neuropathy is diabetes. So they should take that as a secondary claim and add it, okay? Same thing with back radiculopathy, okay? If, if you have a, a lumbar spine problem that's pinching a nerve, your, your sciatica, and it's causing numbness or pain down one of your legs, that again, that diagnosis of radiculopathy can only be secondary to the, what, you're, what you're claiming for service connection, which is the lower back. Having said all that, if Carol were here, she'd be shaking her head at me. You still need to claim that. If you know you have those disabilities, claim those secondary disabilities because the VA could just forget or they could lump in the radiculopathy with the back or the neuropathy with the diabetes, okay? So if you know you have it, claim it. Are they supposed to, through their duty to assist, go ahead and get that? Yes. Do they always do that? No. You know, at the end of the day, they have a duty to assist you to win your claim. But what I always say is make it easy for them, okay? You still have to be your number one advocate and you still have to be the one saying, this is what's going on with me because there's no one else that knows better than you, okay? <clears throat> Go on again. Do you have to be 100% permanent total unemployable to get student, student loan forgiveness, or can you be 100% permanent total with employability status? You just have to be 
you have to be IU or 100% that is permanent total. That's all that matters. It's a permanent total that you got to have. All right. Current wait times on CMP exams. Ray, I, I'm not even going to guess. I have no idea. Um, it, it varies from region to region around the country. And, and getting them back also varies. Tom de bomb bombadil 13 or 19 i had a cmp exam for migraines in february 2000 uh in february 23 got deferred now and i just got a letter saying they will do a medical examination review it says i don't have to show up is this considered ace um i don't know if it's considered ace or not but but it's pretty common when they do a medical file review um they're just looking at your medical records they're trying to see if um you know, the original examiner got it right. If the original examiner wrote something that the adjudicator doesn't understand, they send it back. And then it's just a medical record review a lot of times saying, okay, did you answer this question? You saw him already, but did you thoroughly answer this? Or please clarify what you did say here, not there. All right. I need a uh, one second review here, break. Um, my son is coming in on a plane and uh, my mother needs to know exactly where he's coming from. So let me just uh, get this over to her real quick. I apologize for the momentary delay. Please take a sip of your coffee, do whatever else you need uh, and go from there. All right, we're back at it. Sorry about that interruption. Yolanda again, threw out my back in service, called ER for advice, but didn't go to sick call because not in records. Have service connected bilateral plus planus, bilateral hip and knee pain with arthritis. Can back pain and sciatica be secondary to feet, knee, and hip? Yes. This is what I call that good old song. You know, the, the hip bones connected to the knee bone, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone. Wait a minute. Knee bones connected to the hip bone, whatever, how it goes. But all of that is connected. If you have to adjust your gait for a bad foot or a bad knee, that's going to go upstream, okay? That's going to throw off your hip. If your, th your hip's thrown off, that's going to make your, your, your lumbar spine or your sci sciatica be thrown off as well. So yes, all of that can migrate upwards. Miss Cranky Pants, good to see you. Uh, will VA partially approve an initial claim package and start paying while other diagnoses are being rewarded? Or do all claims in the package have to be adjudicated before the veteran sees any money? They will start paying. If they give you a rating decision with five issues and three of them are granted and two are deferred, they will start paying on those three. And number two, I choose Miss Cranky Pants name because working with the VA has made me chronically grouchy. <laughs> Should be a service connection. I love that. Is there is there a code for VA frustration live out loud? I love the name. The, 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 the reasoning behind the name is even better. That just made my day, Miss Cranky Pants. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I hear you. That it, it can be more than frustrating. It's more frustrating than it should be. But um, thank you for that laugh. That's great. Mad. I wonder where that came from. Seven months post HLR decision failure and duty to assist and four months post third round of CMP exams after higher level review. Still no decision. Have read recent CMP, which did not find nexus. Can I still add supportive evidence until I get a decision? Okay, this just, let's back this up for everybody, okay? So you get a decision, you disagree with it, and you can go for a higher level review, all right? A higher level review is basically just looking at what took place below and whether it was right or wrong or whether they need to redo it. You are not allowed to add evidence at that point, okay? But here in this case, there was a higher level higher level review decision that found a duty to assist error, meaning that the lower adjudicator did not fully assist the veteran and they sent it back for another round of CMP exams. OK, at this point, yes, you can add evidence because they are adding evidence. OK, add evidence whenever you need to add a rebuttal to the CMP exam, whatever you need to do, put the evidence in there. And then once there's another decision, if that's higher level review, they have to look at everything because they ask for more evidence. You can still add more. Great, great question, Matt. Sandy, have you heard anything about reimbursement for caregiver program pre-9-11 veterans? Thank you. I have not. Uh, 
this whole area is just in flux right now. The VA doesn't really want to pay these claims, to be honest. And um, the problem I'm seeing is uh, the uh, the adjudication of these claims is tied up in the VA Health Administration, and they're not they don't really know what to do with them. They don't really know how to do appeals. So I don't know what's going on with this. There's a there's a really big case up in the federal circuit to determine if they even have uh, if the veteran has the right to appeal these cases. So um, I don't I, other than that, I don't know anything. Richard Tomes have uh, TDIU claims since uh, February 2023 sent my last employer form. Um, but they have not replied to the VA or me. Will the VA go on with the claim or just wait? Last employer was U.S. Census. Yeah, you gotta love that. Some one government entity uh, trying to get a hold of the other government entity. So how they do this? Their manual dictates that they have to send this form, the twenty one forty nine ninety two, to your employer once, and then wait a couple months, and then send it again and wait a couple months. Rarely do I see that employers actually return this unless the veteran knows somebody there and can, can push it along because the VA, because the employer doesn't want to get involved. They don't want to get sued. Um, so they do this as a matter of course, sending out this form, but it has no, um, honestly, it, it's like non-evidence in your claim. Okay. If they don't respond, that's not held against you. Then they go on and adjudicate the claim, but they wait. The problem is they wait. It's going to, it's, it's, I believe it's 60 days for the first one, no response, and at least 60 days for the next one. And then once they get that no response, or once they don't get a response, then they move forward with your claim to get whatever evidence they need and, and, and then to decide it. Lonnie, <clears throat> BBA question. I requested a hearing two years ago. Can I switch to another lane, direct review? If so, will I lose my place in line? You cannot switch. Once you get past that one year mark from that prior decision, you cannot switch. Uh, what, uh, unfortunately, I'm hearing VSOs and these um, pre, I don't know what they call themselves, coaches or basically people who are getting in this kind of slyly and frankly, I don't think legally, um, you know, Vetch Guardian and, and, and uh, some of these places, what they're telling vets to do is drop their case at the BBA. Just file again, they say. Well, the problem with that is you lose any past benefits, okay? So right now, Lonnie, you're in a quagmire because you filed for a hearing two years ago. It's probably going to be two, maybe three more years before you get this, unless you're over 75, you can show financial problems or uh, severe health problems, okay? Or you have a Bronze Star. Um, any of those at the BVA will get you advanced on the docket. If you are, don't have those and you're waiting, you know, you got to weigh it out. Should you just give up those past benefits and refile? If you do refile, the thing you got to realize is you've already been denied at the regional office. So what happens if you refile, you're denied at the regional office, and then you go back to the BVA? Well, you are way back in the line, okay? And you're waiting forever again, even in direct review. I'm seeing direct review cases, you know, they're saying it's supposed to take 365 days. I've got cases in 2020 that have not been answered yet. Okay. So you got to weigh those. Uh, and if somebody's whispering in your ear, Hey, I can win this at the beginning. I would want to know what evidence they think can help you win this and what evidence are they going to produce? Because if you drop that place, you're gone. No more retro benefits. You got to go back to the beginning and you got to somehow have something different that didn't, you know, you, you didn't have in the first place that you think is so overwhelming and so strong that it's going to win where it did not win there in the RO. I'm sorry you're in that position. I honestly think they need to change this law because there are so many vets who went into the hearing lane that didn't really understand what, what was going on and they would rather be in the direct lane. But as it is, it doesn't work. Kids EDU, good to see you again. I received SMC L and a half based on QTC doctor's great write-up on her exam of me. Okay, so I'm just making sure everybody understands this. Again, we're talking about special monthly compensation. That's something you get above and beyond 100%. L and a half is a, is a very high, strong rating. Uh, and QTC is, a, is an exam company that the VA uses for the CMP exams. She strongly endorsed my need for aid and attendance and strongly implied my aid and attendance need was warranted by my VA-rated physical diabetes, the disabilities by themselves, and that my 100% PTSD, depression, anxiety, TBI also in itself warranted an AMA. From these HMP videos, I learned that actually justifies the SMCR1 and 
appealed my SMC L and a half rating. Sadly, the VA denied my appeal requesting R1 claim because it was a combination of my physical and mental. Uh, can I recontact the QTC and get a doctor who examined me to clarify her statement to more clearly say that the physical and mental disabilities each separately warranted A and A for R1? You cannot, you cannot directly do that, but what you can do is ask for a higher level review. Hopefully this was not higher level review and say that they made a duty to assist error by not asking the doctor specifically, are you eligible for aid and attendance for your physical disabilities? And are you eligible for a separate aid and attendance for your mental health conditions? Okay. You need the doctor to do both those. And the only way you can force them to do that is to go through the VA. And the way through the VA is to say, this is a failure of the duty to assist. I am eligible for aid and attendance for multiple different disabilities for, you know, you take your Venn diagram and what they're saying is you've got mental disabilities, you've got physical disabilities, but the only way you're getting AA is the combination of the two. Well, guess what? Each of these on their own can give you an aid and attendance. So you need to write them and say, this is a failure of duty to assist. I want my physical disabilities and my mental disabilities to be rated, to be evaluated independently to see if each could cause aid and attendance. You're right on, don't stop, okay? RO screws this up a lot. We have to take a lot of these cases to the board, especially when we're, we're when we get above L, it's very, very hard to win at, at the uh, regional office. Anything M and above, we just find the VA, if the regional office doesn't get it very well. Your case in particular, because you're jumping from L and a half, which is, I don't even know anymore, 4,000, 4,300, all the way up to almost $9,000 a month. Uh, the VA at the regional office is very reticent to do that, unfortunately. So write that duty to assist argument for the regional office. And then from there, if that doesn't go, then, then take it up to the uh, board. Tom, part one, 71 years old, mental health rating of 70%. I recently had to resign from my last employer. During my mental health CMP, the examiner said I should be TDIU, if not 100% PNC. Okay. Part two, I would like to file for TDIU. However, my previous employer is telling everyone that I retired. I sent HR a letter saying that I accept my resignation, but not retirement. What should I do? That doesn't matter, Tom. What matters is, can you work now? Okay. And not even can you get a job, but can you maintain, can you keep that job? Can you go day to day? And, and I bet you here, you had to put up with a lot of BS that you didn't want to either a boss that was micromanaging you customers that were uh, aggravating or coworkers that were annoying. Could you go do that day to day? That's what matters. It doesn't matter what your papers say in the last job. File the TDIU claim now. When you get to your CMP exam, say, look, this is what I was dealing with. And this is why I had to quit. I was going to kill somebody. I was going to scream, uh, whatever. Okay. The fact that your, your last employer put that, who cares? It doesn't matter anymore. What matters are the facts of your daily life and how this PTSD affects you you need to file this ASAP. Love pause, good to see you again. If I apply for PACT Act presumption along with an increase for existing connected service connected disabilities, how will the effective dates be determined? Can you explain the August deadline? Thanks for your time. So the August deadline only applies for the PACT Act, meaning if you apply by August, then you get retroactive to when the PACT Act started. For your other disabilities, that does not apply and it's just when you file file that claim to reopen. Well, I'll pause again. Have there been any decisions made on any of the Camp Lejeune cases? What is the current status of those filings? What is the deadline for a new filing and what must be completed by that date? Okay, multiple questions here. There, so how this works is the Department of Navy has to offer a settlement first, okay? Most cases, you can do one of two things. You can go to the Department of Navy, say, Here's the disability I have. It's related to Camp Lejeune. Um, I'm filing a claim for that. Okay. And then the Department of Navy gets to decide that. You can skip that and go right to the federal court and say, I'm filing a lawsuit against the government. But typically, most people want to go through the Department of Navy because you could hopefully get a faster resolution there. If the Department of Navy gives a settlement that's not uh, enough or um, they, they say, no, we, we're, we're not admitting any liability, then you do take it to the court, federal court from there. Um, the last um, what do they call it? Status conference where the judge who who's overseeing all this had with the government and the plaintiff's counsel and the, and the veterans council. He said, how many cases are before 
the Department of Navy. And there were 100, 100,000, I, I don't know, 150,000. And the judge asked, how many of those have the Navy offered a uh, offer of settlement for? And the answer was zero. The Department of Navy is sitting on all these cases doing absolutely nothing. The judge got furious and basically said, by the next time we have a status conference, which I think is next month, I'm not positive, um, Next time we have a status conference, you must come back and let us know how many of these have been settled. This cannot wait. Okay. So that's the first one. Well, the current status of those filings. And there's been no lawsuits that have been uh, but been put on the docket yet because the judge, frankly, wants to see what is the Department of Navy going to do first. There is no deadline right now. You can file those cases, um, get them in. Again, this is different than VA benefits. You have to have an attorney because the attorney appeals bef appears before the, the federal judge. You do not want to do this on your own. VA benefits are confusing, but anybody who really concentrates, heck, you read my website, you read other good attorneys' websites, you can do that on your own. You cannot go to a federal court and do that on your own. People try it all the time, but then they get their case kicked out for stupid procedural reasons. So you definitely want an attorney to do that. Um, I think I answered all those questions. So I'll pause if I didn't. Uh, get back to me, but that's where we are at uh, Camp Lejeune. Michael, I am 100% P&T. Is static condition the same as the five-year rule or 10-year rule? Um, a static condition is, is a little bit different, and then basically what it means is they are not going to actively go to you and review you. They're saying this condition is not going to get better. It's not going to improve. It's frankly not going to get worse. So we are not going to set you up for a future CMP exam. So it's it's different. Now, if you go in and you ask for an increase in that disability, well, they're going to review you and, and instead of, you know, they, it might be that instead of increasing you, they actually decrease you. But static just simply means that they are not uh, scheduling you for future CMP date. Chris, denied service connection for migraine secondary to tinnitus. I have a nexus, log for two years, buddy letters, medical records. What's my best recourse? Appeal with your firm's help? or go to HLR, then appeal. I mean, I definitely would take this to the HLR high level review. That's going to be the fastest way for you to get a decision. And that's what we've been trying in-house is to try to get all our cases resolved at the regional office because the turnaround times there are much better than going to the board. Some disabilities, some cases are unfortunately so nuanced that really only a lawyer or a judge at the board is going to understand it. You have to go to the board. But I would definitely try uh, HLR first. If you want us to look at this, we're more than happy to. If you have a nexus, you have the, I mean, first of all, let me say, Chris, you've done the work here. I applaud that. Okay. You got the nexus. You got the log. That means you worked really hard for two years, buddy statements, medical records. I think you got it. It sounds to me like you got a very good case there. I would appeal it to the HLR first. I mean, would we take this case? There's probably a good probability we would, but at the same time, if you've done all this work, I'd say go for it. Okay. Um, if you want an attorney to look at it, we're, we're always happy to do that for anybody to look at their cases. Uh, but I, again, I applaud you. You did not sit on your haunches and let the VA supposedly, you know, do their duty to assist. You got the evidence and, and you're proactive. And that's the one thing that I stress the most is have the knowledge and be proactive and fight for your claim. Craig, 2015 VA psychiatrist noted in my file that my insomnia was due to pain for my service connected disabilities. I recently filed for insomnia, but was denied. I think the VBA did not get that note from my local VA. Um, what can I do? So you can appeal. I, you said VBA. VBA stands for Veterans Benefit Administration, and I'm hoping you didn't mean BVA. Actually, Craig, if you're here, please correct that for me or, or, or say you meant VBA, Veterans Benefit Administration, or you meant the BVA, Board of Veterans Appeals, um, because... Well, I guess either way, what I would do is file a supplemental claim. Um, no, I wouldn't. If, if you're talking about you got an original decision, I would file a higher level review and say this is a failure of the duty to assist to fully understand my claim. My claim is a secondary claim to my service-connected disabilities. I'm not claiming that the insomnia happened in service. I'm, ha I'm claiming it, be it happened because of these disabilities that are related to service caused this. That would be my higher level review appeal, okay? If you just filed this original claim. If you didn't, and this is at the Board of Veterans Appeals, um, I'm just trying to think of this, if it's that Veterans Board of Appeals, then you go back down and you file a supplemental claim, okay? And if you file that supplemental claim, 
um, you need new and relevant evidence. And your new and relevant evidence could be a note from your doctor saying this is secondary to these disabilities. Okay. So those are the two different scenarios there. All right. Jerome, service connected for migraines with Aurora. Uh, Aura. Uh, notice mistake in the VA records that shows my migraines are without it. Another mistake showed that I smoked and quit 15 years ago. I never smoked. How hard it is to, to correct this? Okay, so I'm not sure what your end game is here. And by that, I mean, um, if you're already service getting for migraines, are we talking about you want an increase? Or are you just wanting to purge your records and, and clean your records? If you're wanting to clean your records, you need to go through the Veterans Health Administration, the VHA, and speak to the custodian and then speak to a, a doctor saying, this is in my records and this is incorrect. If you want an increased rating for migraines, you don't need to worry about that at all. Okay, the Aurora. Um, the, because what's going on and what you're seeing doesn't actually give you an increase. What gives you an increase is how often do you have to be prostrate how often do you have to lay down? How often do you have to be in a dark room to get away from everything to then recover from the migraines? Um, so I, I'm not sure what you're looking for. If you're looking just to clean your records, go to the doctor, go to the custodian at the um, at the healthcare center and talk to them. But if you're looking for a higher rating, it's really more about how often did the migraines knock you out. Carlos, 100% with 70% PTSD. I had a CMP exam rate me 100%. Do I receive retroactive payment? Uh, well, so that really depends on, um, you said you are 100% P&T. It just depends when were you rated 100% P&T and versus when are you rated now for the 100% for PTSD? Let's say uh, January of this year, you're at 100% for what looks like combined. For, and then uh, March this year, you become 100% for just the um, PTSD. If if this happened here, the PTSD happened here, and your original was down here, there, there's there's no more benefits. Okay. However, if again you're in January, you're 100% for the combo, but then let's say January of the year prior, they award you the 100% for PTSD, you get that difference, okay? If you were at 70%, now you're at 100, you get the difference between those two. But once you become 100%, uh, you don't get a difference there. You could be entitled to SMCS if you have 100% for one issue and 60% for other combined issues. So. All right, Jim, I have an aorta aneurysm. It, there is some medical research that say it might be secondary to psoriasis. What's the best way to try to do a nexus? Mm. Well, the first stop I would have would be to your doctor who is treating you for the psoriasis, okay? And say, hey, is this something that could be secondary? If he says yes, then you want to have him write up a statement just basically saying, I treat him for psoriasis. He now has a problem with his heart. I believe this is secondary to a psoriasis. And then if he can give a, you know, a uh, statement on on basically a, uh, I would say one or two senses saying why he believes that or what the medical literature says. Remember, it's as likely as not, okay? The doctor does, you don't have to have it to a degree of medical certainty, which is doctors are typically used to. It's basically tie goes to the runner, all right? It's as likely as not if if there is a, um, you know, if there's literature, literature suggesting this or suggesting a strong correlation, I think that's strong enough and you just need to let your doctor know, hey, this is all we need. Randomly rusty. Does my purple heart allow me to advance my first initial claim with the VA or can I advance every time I submit for an increase? This is my third eval for an increase. If you are allowed to advance for the first claim, then yes, you can advance for all of them. I, my understanding though was that only applied at the board, but if they allowed you to advance at the regional office, then yes, you should always advance. Adam, I've been waiting two years for a direct re review lane. They recently sent me my docket number. Does the docket number help determine how much longer I might have to wait? <laughs> um, they're supposed to publish docket numbers, okay? And from that, you should be able to figure it out because they, they post them by year. You know, if they're saying, okay, we're working on 2022 December, December. Well, if your docket number is 2023 February, in theory, you should be able to, uh, they should be coming to you quickly. Um, I have seen them post it and then take it down and then post it again. And, you know, they go from, let's say that they go from January, 2022 
They take it down. And the next thing I know, it's February 2020. Um, so they're, they're all over the place. Um, it's good to know what your docket number is. Uh, you know, they're always going to work older cases first. Frankly, it's extremely frustrating and they haven't explained why they do that, why they'll go backwards, but they do sometimes. So, um, you know, it's a little piece of information, but it's not a clincher. Alan, if you receive a pension from another job that has nothing to do with the military and you have 70 or 80%, can you still get TDI? TDIU, total disability due to unemployability. The answer to this is yes. And this is a very important question, Alan, okay? I see this a lot. People get scared. They say, hey, look, I have stocks that give me dividends. I have uh, rental houses that, that are paying me. I have a pension. You need to realize you're not actively working anymore for that. Those are prior benefits you earn, just like social security disability. You're not actively working to get those, those payments, okay? Those payments are due to you due to prior work. And even if you had a rental home, that's passive income. That's not something you're actively working on. So you need to apply if you have not already. Annette, how long do you have to file if a surgery was done for you by the VA? What is the form used? Annette, I can't, off the top of my head, I don't know the name of the form. This is something I would go to a VSO or a patient advocate in the hospital that you went to or clinic. And I would say, um, how long do you have to file? I think, you know, there's no time limit, I don't think, but the sooner you file, the sooner you get the benefits. So I, I don't know, um, you know, I'd say a year at the most. John, I had three documented back injuries while on active duty in the 80s and 90s. In 2009, I had a deb deb debilitating back pain again in 2011. Five RFA five RFA letter later, I filed a claim in 2021, denied, appealed, denied. Okay. Appealed in 2021, waiting for higher level review, wrote two letters to my senators for two months, nothing back. What can I do? Oh, that is a long time. Uh, I, I would write again to your senator. I would write to your uh, local congressman. Um, I'd also start calling the VA weekly saying, where is this? What's going on? This is the higher level review. You don't need any more information. Frankly, I can't send in any more evidence uh, that, that I'd be worried this is lost in the system somewhere. We have cases that are a bit old and higher level review, but two years is, is too long. So keep, you know, you, you need to keep being noisy and pesting, pestering, pestering them to hopefully get you that decision. Ivan, 100% PNT. I have presumptive packed act issues, asthma, and HLR, HRL to file. Do I file still because I'm worried about DIC or don't file? <sighs> yeah, you know, this is one of those things that um, my overall philosophy is if I have 100%, my vet's 100%, they're PNT, and there are, there are other issues that they should be service connected for but aren't going to get them anything like not going to get us up to a special monthly comp level. I'm not filing that because I don't want to mess around and I don't want to uh, have the VA looking at that file again. That being said, DIC is a case where I would strongly consider filing. And for those of you who don't know, basically what he's doing is he's looking after his wife. Okay. If he were to die due to HRL or, or asthma, where those were, were two issues that could have caused him his death, then, um, and those were service connected, then his wife would be entitled to a monthly pension. It's not the same that the veteran's getting now, but it would be, you know, I think it's like $1,400. I'm not quite sure what it is off the top of my head. Um, so this is an issue where if those are presumptive connections, I'd file it. Okay. And that's for peace of mind for you and peace of mind for her. So I'm going against my rule of I never file anything once I'm hundred percent because I don't want the VA coming back to me. And I'm going against it because if those issues could lead to, to Ivan's death, then we want his wife to be in a position to be able to get the benefits she deserves ASAP. Major, what is considered a stressor event during Desert Storm? I was denied PTSD in 94 because they could prove experienced combat. Um, if you were in the combat zone in, in 94, then basically what they're saying, what they have to determine is did, did, um, you know, being around 
enemy combatants or being in, in a zone where there were enemy combatants, did that cause your PTSD? Was that a stressor? So they need to, you know, they should concede the fact that if you were there and you can show you're in uh, Southwest Asia during that time, and, you know, even if you weren't fighting directly, um, but if you were in that theater, they got to say, well, would that have caused the PTSD you have? So that's what they're supposed to be looking at for a stressor. Brian, good morning. What advice would you give military members before their discharge? I work on a military base and I talk to a lot of military members about the importance of filing VA claim. So the advice I'd give before the, you know, Brian, here's what's one of the things that most frustrates me is that uh, I think we saw this a little bit back. A veteran had a back problem, but they never reported it to their doctors because they were worried about, hey, how's this going to affect me advancing in my career? Are they going to try to kick me out? What I would really uh, strongly suggest to anyone is start documenting your problems before you get out. So let's say you had a back problem five years ago, you never reported and you're, you're about to get out. I would go ahead and say, look, doc, I got to tell you something. I fell off a ladder five years ago, hurt my back. I never said anything because I didn't want to cause you know any ruffles or whatever. I was worried about my career, but this thing has still been hurting me. Okay. Speak to your doctor, your PA, your nurse practitioner, whoever, and give them every problem you've had. We want that documented in service before they get out. Okay. If you don't have that opportunity, when you go to your discharge exam, talk to them then and say, Hey, look, my back hurts. I have asthma. I have migraines. And, and if they want to know where it came from, then make sure you write that down. This problem started this, this place or that place that counts as evidence of an in-service incident. And that is super important. So Brian, I'm glad you're there on base to be able to tell vets this because you know, I get too many vets that come to me and they get out and they say, Hey, I never complained about this in service because you know, that, that wasn't, that wasn't my mission. My mission was to get up and be a strong Marine, be a strong soldier and not complain. They use that against you. Okay. So Brian, that's what you want to do. You want to say, before you get out, talk about anything that happened. It doesn't matter how far back it was. If you're in 20 and this happened 18 years ago, who cares? Talk about it now because if it's still bothering you and it started back then, you know, we, we can show that it happened in service and that's what we want to do to be able to show uh, that's related to service and therefore service connected. Thank you, Brian, for your service. 13 Lazen Kush. Okay. Long story short, claim filed in 15, granted 50% for PTSD, but back pay was only at 30%. Can I appeal that and argue my CMP examiner ran out of time and very critical info was missed at 70%. Oh yeah. You, 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 you file whatever appeal you want. You know, a lot of times you see that where you got a long claim going like that and they just try to buy you off. Okay. So it sounds like not only 50%, but it should be 70. So the back going all the way back, it should be longer. And what you can do um, you can use their words against them and that say the same symptoms for which you, you granted me 50% were present back then. Okay. I, I, it's not like it just happened at this date and make sure you uh, push them on those and then also push them up to 70 and, and even IU if, if uh, this is keeping it hard to work as well. Oh, can I challenge back pay amount effect dates? Yes. Could a higher level review award me a higher rating if they feel it's appropriate? Yes. But the evidence has to be in the file of the higher, uh, of the higher rating already. Okay. Rich, what are the main reasons TDIU claims take so long? Okay. So we spoke about this earlier. There's that form 4192 that they send employers. Okay. They're going to send it once. If the employer doesn't answer, they're going to wait 60 days and then it comes back. Then they got to send another one for another 60 days. Those don't necessarily happen concurrently. Okay. So they get that first one back. If they're not on top of it and send the second one out, Whenever they send that second one out, that's going to be another 60 days. Okay. And then they got to always send you to an exam. Um, they got to get paperwork of where you last worked. Uh, and, and, you know, other than that, I can't really say why it should take longer. I don't know that these take that much. They take longer, granted, but they shouldn't be taking, you know, four times as long as a regular one. Catherine, hubby has cardiomyopathy. And doctors have stated untreated hypertension is the only way to have this condition. Doctors have written letters saying the condition could go back as far as 25 years, but he's still being denied because it didn't manifest itself while on active duty. What can he do in this case? This is tough. Um, what a doctor says now about what happened 25 years ago, if there isn't something in the record from 25 years ago, that doctor can't put an incident service with his 
with his statement. Okay, we have to show that something in service was happening. So I'm just trying to think how else, you know, you got to get creative in cases like this. So was your husband under a lot of, I mean, so the easiest thing to do would be look at blood, uh, all his blood pressure readings in service. And if we have something that's pre uh, uh, hypertensive or straight up hypertensive, go with that. Okay. That's, that's the best and easiest way. If we do not have that, can we show what he was doing was extremely stressful? Can we show that he was under stress for an extensive amount of time? If we can show that, then can we go to the doctor and say, look, he was under all this stress. Could this stress have caused his hypertension? And if the doctor says yes, then we're, we've got, so you got to put in a claim for hypertension. And the doctor says yes, then we're going to say, well, is this hypertensive heart, a heart condition? And then we say yes from there. So I would look, hopefully there's, you know, blood pressure ratings that get him where it needs to be. If not, then again, you got to be creative. And I, I would look at the stress because to me, he probably had hypertension because of some form of stress while he was in service. Happiness. If mental symptoms of TBI and combat PTSD are inseparable and veteran needs regular aid and attendance for episodes of, for uh, aid and attendance for protection of episodes and meds, is it possible to get SMCT case? Yes. You will not be able to separate out and get two different ratings for the TBI and the PTSD if they're, if the symptoms are inseparable, that's what's called pyramiding. If the symptoms are the same for two different disabilities, then they're just going to rate you on the higher one. But you certainly can get SMCT if uh, you can show the need for aid and attendance and show that they need a, a higher level of care than just 100%. B. Barker, I need to get stuff rolling for secondaries added to multiple claims. What's the best, best place to start? Well, if you've already have the first one rated or you have the first one going, meaning like, let's say your, your initial claim is a back. If you have the back service connected and you have secondary claims, file those secondary claims. If you have the back claim that hasn't been granted yet, file those secondary claims anyway, because you want to get an effective date for this back. Yolanda again, how would a dependent of a deceased veteran who lived on base with them apply for packed back conditions? Hmm. Yolanda, my understanding is um, only the veteran can get uh, benefits for the packed back conditions. Now, if it's a dependent, a current dependent of, of a veteran, then the, they could apply for what's called DIC benefits, basically saying the veteran died due to these disabilities. And then they would get a pension based on the veteran service. But as far as a direct uh, cause of action for the dependent who lived on the base, who has you know, those presumptive conditions, I do not believe that is in the congressional statute that, that authorized the PACT Act. So I don't think there's a direct cause of action there. <laughs> LOMF always. What are the specific requirements for dry eye? DBQ for is every eye condition is way too general. What disorder, what disorders of the lacrimal, how bad does your vision have to be? I got to tell you, I don't deal with enough eye cases to know this in the back of my head. I have to look at this every single time. I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. One thing I would do, it sounds like you've actually looked uh, you've looked at the DBQ, okay, and talks about way too general conditions. Now go look at the diagnostic codes. And Nate, if you will throw up a link to that, find the eyes diagnostic codes and go from there, okay? And then look and basically research and see what um, what symptoms under any of those eye conditions do you have and what should that rating be? Donald, I first filed in 2013. I asked that they consider the earliest effective date is the day after my discharge. Since I still have claims to be adjudicated, will they address my request for an earlier day? Is that the... They should be concurrently addressing all your claims at once. Even if you have claims that are on the initial level, if this is going up to the higher level review, they should appeal. They should be addressing that. If it's going up to the Board of Veterans Appeals, they should address that. You can have multiple claims all over the place with the VA. And just because you have one claim here doesn't mean they get to toll or stop adjudicating a, a claim at another level. <laughs> Charm. Do you know if you do you know if you had a hysterectomy, 
it's a missing organ and you get 50% plus three months of temporary 100% for three months if you got it during military or after military service. It's not spoken about enough. Well, I appreciate you. Oh, part two. Also, I appreciate you bringing that up. And that's part of what we do here is we inform each other. Um, you know, I like to uh, share my information, but it's always great to get information from other folks as well. I'm 90%. According to the VA math, I need another 60% for permanent 100% should know something by next week. Well, hey, best of luck to you. And Charm, please get back to us and let us know how you did and uh, and what they said. I'm looking forward to hearing from that. Wayne, hey, Matt, messaged you last week about higher level review on the day. And the examiner commented how much evidence I had and expert opinions and was denied so many times. Well, she granted my sleep apnea claimed the next day. That's great to hear. All right, Wayne. Glad to see that. Richard, hello. If I previously had 90% rating for diabetes, sleep apnea, et cetera, and just received 100% rating for eye cancer, should I file additional claims for bilateral organs, eyes? Not sure. Yes, if the other eye is bad, file that claim because we're looking at more than 100% for that. Um, and if you, you you already are going to be at um, SMCS at least uh, because you're 100% for one disability and you've got all those other disabilities. But if your other organ, and, and Richard, Kudos to you that you understand and you've done this reading. Um, bilateral organs, you know, if you have eyes are the most common, lungs can be another one. But if, if you have a bad eye due to, to VA and the other eye has so much strain on it that it, that it loses strengths, it loses acuity, um, that even though the second eye is not related to, to the uh, first one at all, it still has to be service connected. Um, so this is a case where even though you're 100%, I'm filing for that second eye. It's that time. Good to see you. Where can I find info on how to get a higher, how to get higher aid in attendance? If you look on the VA site for um, aid in attendance, you know, search on their site. They should have information on there. You can also search our site. Uh, I did a little demo on this, um, but we have a cool new toy. Um, and I guess I, I can't do it here right now, but if you go on our website and the, hopefully you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, it'll say, ask a question um, on that. It, it, it's basically like chat GPT where you go in and you ask a specific question, ask about higher level aid and attendance, and it'll give you a specific answer. And then below give you the blog post or the videos that that came from. Uh, so it, it kind of synthesizes all the information we have. I think we're over 1200 blogs now. And so it can get a little hard to kind of read through all the stuff, but hopefully that will uh, educate you a little bit more on what you're looking for. Tommy, what number to call to speak to an attorney to help me with MST? I'm 90% now for diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, tinnitus, Parkinson's. I take it you're looking for service connection. Uh, I don't, uh, you could call our office, Nate, if you put up that number, I don't have it memorized off the top of my head. We're always happy to, to look at cases. We, if you're looking to file this case, we tip, we very, very rarely file new claims. Um, so it'd be something I would encourage you to file yourself. Uh, and hopefully through the duty to assist, VA finds your records and get you service connected for that. Um, if they deny you, then that that's the time I would look to to go to a paid advocate. But it, you know, my thought is if you can get the money you deserve first without having to pay for somebody, you should do that. And look, uh, thanks, Nate, for putting that up. Philip, thank you, Helen Ponton, for my 100% PNT. I fought for over eight years. Now let's get that back pay. Great, I'm glad to see the PNT is there. All right, John Price, I had a CMP exam. They noted another condition. I got another CMP exam for that condition without filing for it. Is this normal? Yes, this is how it's supposed to work. Again, your claim is everything you file and what the evidence shows that, that should be filed as well. Okay, so if you file for a back claim and you have radiculopathy, that pain running down your legs and the evidence shows that you have radiculopathy, there's a diagnosis of it, they should be, uh, they should be, sending you to an exam and, and, and creating a rating for that as well. Bobby, 100% PNT for PTSD. Is it worth applying for ED? ED would give you um, loss of use of an organ, which is SMCK. You, you get a 0% rating, okay? And then, uh, but it would give you another 140 a month. So if you have a doctor saying that's why you have ED, I'd file it.
Marquise, I was diagnosed by the VA with having PTSD with suicidal tendencies from a series of domestic violence from my former spouse. Is there more to this? How? This is different. Okay. I, so I, I didn't see a question there. Um, if there is a question, Marquise, please put it back up and Nate will grab it for me. How is it legal for the VA to deny claims and not be held accountable for duty to assist on top of that, who made it legal for them to round down percentages? Uh, this is all in statute, unfortunately. I mean, as far as, far as them legal to deny claims or not, they, they have the discretion to decide if a claim is valid or not. They also have a, an administrative process for appeals if you disagree with them. And so that's what the system was put in place under statute. Um, as far as you know, rounding down, again, that's in statute as well. I, these are frustrations, Izzy, that I that I have as well, but um, they're not things that can be fought. What can be fought is through the system to get you to those benefits, to get you a rating that pushes you to at least, uh, you know, 10 or 15 or five or above to get you that next higher rating. Randy B, CMP examiner said that I have a favorable condition of degenerative arthritis in my left knee and I'm starting to get the same style of pain in my right knee. I am thinking of filing a new claim for arthritis and secondary for my rating for degenerative disc disease in my lumbar spine. Yes, file those ASAP. Is there a good chance to get this rated? It depends on the evidence, Randy, but uh, that looks like a good claim to me. I mean, that's the problem with a knee is it can throw your other knee out of whack. And then once that's happening, or even before that happens, your gait gets out of whack and it causes problems with your back. File it. Philip again, would the VA give me 100% P&T but deny back pay since 2017? Most of my claims were approved in 2017. If you do not have an ongoing claim for since 2017, meaning you filed, you got the benefits you deserve, but you didn't get the rating you deserved and did not appeal within that year or did not submit new evidence within that year, then that claim has died, it is closed. And so it's whenever you file that new claim that they would have to go back to. Danny, is it a 50% rating if you have a CPAP if your claim was approved? This is for uh, sleep apnea. Yes. 70% mental, 50% migraines, 10% tinnitus. Is sleep apnea bundled in with mental health? It is not in the mental health diagnostic codes. It is separate. So you would get a separate rating for that at 50%. John Kelly, after fifth RFA, I started having radiculopathy in both feet. Now I can barely walk by end of the day. Appealed in 21, waiting for high level review. I talked to my VSO and they said that if I try to file a claim for radiculopathy in my back, claim will start over. I wrote my two senators, what can I do? You can file that claim for radiculopathy. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, that claim should have been taken up in your back claim, but that claim for radiculopathy honestly is, uh, is gonna be the one that gets you the higher rating in your back. Your back will be 20%, maybe 40. Okay, the back ratings are um, absurd. They, they, they just don't really take into consideration the pain and limitations that, that I think they should. But the radiculopathy can be a very high rating. It's going to be 20, it can be 40% for each side. Okay, file that claim now. Jackie, hello. My husband won his claim 100% PT for PTSD plus SMCL for aid and attendance. Great to hear, Jackie. He's also won 30% for migraines for the PACDAC dating back to 2022. Will he get compensation for these migraines? If he was not 100% back in 2022 and that 30% raised his ratings, then yes, he will. Rhapsody Ranch, why would VA send out for CMP exam when they just did the same one at the VA hospital? Uh, your, your answer to this is as good as mine. This is, this is just... The problem is, I think you and I both think logically, there's no logic involved here. And unfortunately, many a time I see VA making decisions and making moves that have nothing to do with logic. So I don't, I don't know. Jeffrey, what's the deal with travel pay? The new BTSSS system is a complete disaster. I, I don't have, uh, I don't have any answers for you on that, but um, you know, you need to press for travel pay. I believe it's over 50 miles now. Uh, but yeah, that's a disaster. Fortunately, I don't have to deal with, I deal with just the service connected benefits. Um, and as far as those side issues, I, I don't have. 
Lisa, does applying for the caregiver stipend option risk my 100% P&T status? It says both caregiver and veteran must fill out application. I, is there more to this? Um, it does not, uh, it should not affect your P&T status. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, your, your rating is through the Veterans Benefit Administration, the VBA. The determination of a caregiver is through the Veterans Health Administration, the VHA. So like the hospitals, what I call the brick and mortar VA, what you actually see. Um, so two different decision makers there, okay? So it should not affect it. Your 100% P&T hopefully will show how you need that though. Virginia, I have a current new condition of GAD, general anxiety disorder, and MDD, major depressive disorder. How do I count for, oh boy, trichotichomania and hey, yeah, yeah, excortion, excortion disorder? DMS has OCD due to anxiety. I have trigger finger due to trick. Um, okay, so how do you, have, how do I account for this disorder? So here's the thing with the with any many health, many mental health condition. If you have a rating for mental health condition, that rating is going to be the same no matter which disorder you have. Okay, so here is a great case where you have a uh, uh, you have a axis one multiple diagnosis here, bunch of different disorders. Okay, mental health conditions. Once you're service connected for one, it doesn't matter what else that is on there. Okay. What matters is the severity of those mental health conditions. So once you have one that's service connected, you need to just go ahead and focus on that. How bad is it? And, and, and you don't need to worry about saying, oh, well, it's my anxiety that causes this or my depression causes this. You just need to look at it and say, overall, my mental health is at what level? Okay. And that's where you focus for there. Um, OCD, I think would be rated under the mental health conditions as well. And so you would not be able to get that separate. The trigger finger though, uh, you could look under the nerve, the nerve ratings um, and see what that would say if, if there's something that would, uh, would give you a separate rating there because that's a, that's a completely different uh, problem. It's a physical manifestation. <laughs> T.A. Chapman, good to see you. Higher level review denied when I was requested my loss of use for lower back, hip, knee, foot issues. Do I go to the BVA or just get them to do a CMP exam for loss of use? Uh, thank you, Matt, for all that you do. Okay, so if they have not done, uh, you got a higher level review. Okay, so this is good to kind of play with now with this new system. Higher level reviews here. Your options are to go back and file a supplemental claim with new and material evidence or to do what TA is talking about and going up to the Board of Veterans Appeals. My concern about you going up to the Board of Veterans Appeals is twofold. One, it's taken forever. Okay. It's, it's, it's pull your hair out, taken forever. Two, once you get a decision, they might say, oh, you need a loss of use CMP exam. So we're going to remand it. They're going to send it all the way back down and you're going to get that. And if they deny you again, once you go to the board again, you're all the way in the back end of the line. I would file a supplemental claim. If you can find some kind of, either you make a statement saying, um, I cannot, you know, I can you got to basically say that you can't walk. And what they want to hear is you cannot propulse off a leg and then you cannot balance on that leg. Okay. So if you could say, look, I try to walk and I can't, I fall down or I just can't get forward momentum going. And therefore I think I have loss of use of my leg. And I request a CMP exam specifically for loss of use. Okay. So if then they deny you with that supplemental claim, you go back to higher level review and say, look, they fail to do their duty to assist. They need to give me a loss of use exam. How can they say I don't have this when there's no medical evidence stating contrary to what I've said? So hopefully you grabbed all that, but I, I would I would start by going back because you're going to get a faster decision there. All right, so we got time for about two, maybe three more questions. All right, uh, Mr. Graham, if passed if passed into law, will Major Star Act apply to all medical retirees or just combat related veterans? Oh, you got me here. I actually don't know what the Major Star Act is. Um, I'll have to do some research on that, but but I don't know. Um, sorry, I can't help you on that one. Silly Goose 41 exclamation point. VA mental health doctor diagnosed me with depression due to service-connected chronic pain. Is that diagnosis plus a nexus letter and IMO enough to grant a mental health commission? Yes, it is. Let's do another, let's do another one here. 
Okay, CFL Stinger GT2. During my CMP exam, my examiner noted radiculopathy due to my back issues. Will the VA automatically add this to my claim or will I have to file a new claim? So this is something, this is the theme we've been talking about today, okay? Your claim is what you file and then what the evidence shows. I'll put that in you know, parentheses there. Um, they should do that, okay? Nothing else causes radiculopathy except a back problem. That That's, you know, it's not like you're saying they say that you have uh, incontinence. You know, you're, you're not able to hold your bladder anymore, which can be caused by your back, but it can be caused by a plethora of other things, okay? This is a situation where it's your back, is the problem you're causing, you're, you're asking service connection for, and you have radiculopathy, which is caused by that. That being said, I'm all about being cautious and putting in a claim for that, okay? Because their duty to assist you is to develop that claim. But if they don't, you know, who loses? You lose. So go ahead and file that claim. And, and, and uh, you know, you're, what you're going to be fighting for is that the effective date should be the same as the back claim. All right. That is what we had time here for today, folks. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the insight you've given me. Um, and I appreciate what all y'all are doing, like Brian, for other vets, uh, making sure that they're getting the benefits they deserve. So please join us again. We'll be back next week, uh, same, same place, same time. And until then, 